call. So now we'll hear from Congressman Schiff. Oh, there you are. They said you were hiding. We're, we're coming at you from both yeah, sides. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, good, great, great. Good morning. It's a pleasure to join you today and have a chance to uh, share a few thoughts on some of the challenges that we face. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure to join my colleagues uh, from the Commerce Justice Science Committee under our capable leadership of Chairman Mollahan and Ranking Member Wolf. Uh, and I want to commend them for the phenomenal work that they do. Uh, many years ago, I was a uh, prosecutor with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, and I was drawn to run for the legislature after six years of being a prosecutor and seeing that for every person that I put away, there were two more waiting where they came from. Uh, and I remember uh, in the state senate trying to find strategies that would deal with this never-ending supply of people to sit in the defendant's chair, uh, trying with uh, some frustration over the years. From time to time, uh, we would elicit testimony and get reports from thoughtful institutions about what was working, what wasn't working. Uh, I remember in particular hearing testimony from someone I respect greatly, Father Greg Boyle, uh, who works with some of the uh, most at-risk youth in Los Angeles. Uh, he was asked, what are the common denominators between those that succeed and those fail? Um, of those that uh, have pulled themselves out of very difficult circumstance, what do they have in common? And I remember a couple things that he said. He said that uh, they had a mentor, that they had someone who cared whether they succeeded or failed, and it might be a parent or a grandparent, it might be a probation officer or a teacher, an aunt or an uncle, but somebody was in that child's life that cared whether they succeeded or failed. And the second common denominator he found was that they were able to get a job. They were able to find work, something productive to do, something that give them, gave them a stake in the community. And from time to time uh, over the years since, I've seen the wisdom of his words, uh, often an analysis of the success of mentorship programs or the centrality of finding employment. But too often, uh, our approach in dealing with the uh, problems of uh, recidivism and public safety uh, has not been to actually look for good analysis, uh, to look for whether our gut instincts are vindicated by uh, what actually works out in the field, but by support for tried and true, so-called tried and true programs, which may not be tried and, well, may have been tried, but may not be at all true. Uh, and in California, unfortunately, I think we've seen the effect of this, uh, as we have a prison system now that is uh, more than 100% uh, over capacity, where we have new approaches that are about to begin but they're not based on necessarily sound analysis or really any analysis, they're based on court order. That the prison population has to be depopulated. Uh, and we are at the uh, um, verge of a massive release, an uh, unprecedented release of people back into the community. Uh, and I would love to say these are people who are gonna go back in the community, they've gotten the drug treatment that they needed or gotten the rehabilitation or the work services they've needed. But the fact of the matter is, it's not being based on any successful model for reintegration so much as it is just the fact the prisons are overcrowded and court is ordering release. This is not the approach that we want to take. Uh, this is the bad news, that states like California are bankrupting themselves, are bankrupting their education system to pay for incarceration costs. The good news is that there are things working all over the country. They're working on a small scale, uh, we know they're out there. Uh, we're trying to replicate them. We're trying to make sure that we can adopt these strategies that work, uh, that can bail out states like California, uh, and that can prevent other states from going over the public safety abyss. Uh, so there are good things. I, I see some of the good things right here in the audience. Uh, Judge Steve Alm with his HOPE program in Hawaii that we're trying through legislation to expand in other parts of the country. Uh, and justice reinvestment strategies that are taking place everywhere that I'm very proud to work with uh, Senator Cornyn uh, and Senator Whitehouse, who you'll hear from shortly, um, as well as my colleague Dan Lundgren here in the House, that look at what's working, uh, that try to replicate those successes around the country and build on success. Uh, there are wonderfully bright people, talented people like yourselves all over the country working on this problem. I want to thank you for your innovative efforts 
uh, and for the tough analysis that you're doing. It's exactly what we need and exactly what we're going to try to push to expand here in Congress. And I thank you. Thank you again. For more than 20 years, but he looks like just a young man, Sheldon Whitehouse has served the people of Rhode Island, championing health care reform, protecting public safety, and helping solve fiscal crises. A former United States Attorney for Rhode Island, the Senator serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee and chairs the Subcommittee on Administrative Oversight and the Courts. The Senator introduced, along with John Conyers, Conyers of Texas, and Patrick Leahy, the Democrat the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act of 2009, which makes grants to states and local governments and tribes to help jurisdiction, jurisdictions manage the growth in spending on corrections and increase public safety. Senator. Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Aubrey, and thank you all for being here. Thank you particularly to the uh, Justice Center, the Pew Center on the States, and the Public Welfare Foundation for inviting me to join you today. I know that uh, all of the organizers are working very hard on justice reinvestment and have made great strides to control spending and growth of correctional systems around the country. And it gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you uh, about these subjects and to contribute in perhaps some small way to your very valuable efforts. As uh, Assemblyman Aubrey mentioned, I was the United States Attorney and then uh, the Attorney General of Rhode Island before I came to the Senate, so I've been engaged with criminal justice issues for some time. I am keenly aware of the many successes of our criminal justice system and of all the hard work put in by law enforcement officers, prosecutors and defense counsel, and corrections officials, but I'm also aware of the shortcomings. As I'm sure you all are too, uh, the trends are not good. A total of 2.2 million American adults are currently incarcerated in state and local prisons and jails, a rate of about one out of every hundred adults. The rate is highest for African American men ages 20 to 34, for whom one in every nine is incarcerated. The number of persons on probation and parole also has been increasing. Currently, approximately five million Americans, one out of every 45 adults, are on probation or parole, an increase of nearly 300% since I came to uh, my first exposure to law enforcement back in 1980. Meanwhile, state spending on corrections has increased over the last 20 years from approximately 12.6 million in 1988 to 20 years later, more than $52 million. Clearly, these increases are not sustainable. With this in mind, several months ago, I met with A.T. Wall, the director of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, who is here with us today, and I'm delighted to see uh, to discuss Rhode Island's situation. He told me that just a few years ago, the trends for growth in the Rhode Island system mirrored the national trends. Seeking more information about that problem, Rhode Island reached out to the Justice Center and the Pew Center on the States for assistance. The Rhode Island Correction System then ran a comprehensive analysis of prison data to diagnose the drivers for growth in the system. This, in turn, prompted statewide bipartisan legislation to standardize the calculation of earned good time credits establish risk reduction program credits, and require the use of risk assessments to inform parole release decisions. As a result of that, the growth of Rhode Island's incarcerated population is now stabilizing. This is quite an achievement, and a testament to how a simple starting point, looking at data to learn what causes prison population growth, can lead to substantial and much needed and bipartisan change. Most policymakers, unfortunately, have limited access to detailed, data-driven explanations about changes in crime, arrest, conviction, and prison and jail population trends. 